We will continue with chapter 7 with lecture number 3. And in this lecture, we're going to put together the consumption function, the savings slash investment function, and then the break even investment function. So, three more pieces to the puzzle. We'll begin with the consumption function. So, we're going to have a very much more simplified version of the consumption function than what we've seen before. Um, we're also going to take a very top-down approach. So remember the national income accounting identity that total output equals, in this case, we have consumption and we have investment. Notice we've assumed away a foreign sector. So this is a closed economy. So there's no import or export, so there's no net exports. And we've assumed away any government activity. So there's no G or T's, right? So there's no government spending and there's no taxes. Now, if we rewrite this, we can write fun consumption as a function of income, well, minus investment. So what we don't save or invest is going to be consumed. If we divide this through by L, all right, and, and define a couple of new variables. So I want to define these variables first. The first variable I want to do is the per worker consumption. Now notice I wrote that in cursive or kind of in cursive. That's supposed to be a little c, which equals big C, big consumption, divided by L. And I'm also going to define another variable. I'm going to define little i. Now, little i is really bad notation, I understand, because it looks like interest rates. It looks like nominal interest rates to me. It probably looks like nominal interest rates to you. But for chapters 7 and 8, we're going to adopt the same kind of bad notation that's in the book, primarily because I can't think of a better notation, uh, which is investment over L, or the little i will be the per worker investment. Now, if I divide this national income accounting identity through by L, I can rewrite it using my new variables little c and little i, like so. Consumption per worker equals output per worker minus investment per worker. Now let's take this a step further. I know that little y equals little f of little k. Right, because that's what little f of little k does. It tells me the per worker, it's the per worker production function which tells me output per worker given a certain amount of capital per worker. But is there a way I can rewrite i such that it makes a little more sense, right? Well, there is. So let's go ahead and we're going to define another variable. We'll define a variable s. And s is equal to what we're going to call the savings rate. S is the percentage of each dollar that we earn, or each, in this case, unit of the aggregate goods that we make, each bit of production, that we save back and invest in capital. So we can rewrite investment to equal, investment equals the savings rate times the amount of output we produce, or we can get that from the per worker production function. Right? Now you can see why this is. This equals investment, which this function right here, s times f of little k, is actually the savings function. But in equilibrium, savings equals investment. So we can rewrite investment as little s times the per worker production function. And so we can rewrite our consumption function as little c equals f of little k minus s times f of little k and that's supposed to be an s or we can simplify that down to 1 minus s times f of little k. Okay. Now you should see here a nice interpretation of s. s is the marginal propensity to save. And so 1 minus s is the marginal propensity to consume. So all we're really saying is we're going to consume the marginal propensity to consume times the amount we produce 
and we're going to save the marginal propensity to save times the amount we are going to um, amount we produce. All right, so we have our production function, and let me rewrite it here. I'll write it: consumption per worker equals one minus the savings rate times the per worker production function. So that's the second piece to our puzzle. We have a production function, now we have a consumption function. Next on our journey is to come up with the savings or investment function. And we've already done that a little bit. So if we look at the savings and investment function, we've already defined this variable s, all right, little s, which is the savings rate. And therefore, that's the percentage of income that we use for savings, which ultimately turns into investment, because in equilibrium, savings equals investment. So we can just go ahead and use what we've already developed. And we have s times f of little k, which equals the savings or savings slash investment function. So we'll call that little i. OK. Now why? Why is that true? Well, notice, little f of little k, that's just another way of saying little y. The savings rate is what percentage of little y we're going to save per worker. And so savings per worker equals little s times f of little k. OK, so let's put this on the graph. We have first of all graphed on here the um, per worker production function now we put on here the savings and investment function which is just s times little f of little k and since s needs to be between 0 and 1 s should be between 0 and 1 you can't save more than your income and you can't really save less than 0 you, we don't have borrowing in this model so we don't have negative savings I know we've had a model where we did do that but not in this one um, and so S of uh, the savings function must be somewhere between the um, horizontal axis and the um, production function. And so we get it looking like this. So if we have capital one, all right, little capital one, so capital per, um, per worker at level one here, we can see that total output is equal to the height of the production function. So we plug capital our capital per worker into the production function and that tells us this height tells us what the maximum amount we can produce is investment is the height of the investment function and of course the difference between the investment function and the um, production function or the difference between investment per worker and output per worker must be consumption per worker Okay, next, we want to add one more function into this, and that's the break-even function. So let's go ahead and define that. Break-even investment is the amount of investment we need in order to keep capital per worker constant. So we have two things working on capital per worker. We have investment on one side. We have depreciation on the other. At least to start out, we just have depreciation. We'll add a little more complicated stuff in a minute. But for right now, we just are wearing capital out. So how much capital would we have to buy in order to keep the capital per worker constant? Well, for right now, what we need to do is we have to add as much as we tear up, all right? as much as wears out. So if one truck wears out today, we better buy another truck. If one machine wears out today, we better buy another machine in order to maintain the same level of capital per worker. And so we'll define delta, that's a script delta, a lowercase script delta, to equal the rate of depreciation. So delta is the rate of depreciation, or the fraction of capital that wears out each period. Now, we're going to call, talk about depreciation per worker. So total depreciation is simply delta, which is the rate of depreciation, times capital per worker. And if we plot that, well, that's just a straight line. Note that the slope of the depreciation function, or the break-even function in this case, is 
the depreciation rate, or script delta. And that concludes lecture number three.